Here's the question I got to ask. I'm going to have Chris go first. Will Google buy Palantir? No. no never will happen. Can first Google of all, a trillion dollar company. Palantir is a measly little $15 billion company. So and why? that's exactly and that's exactly why Google uh Palantir has the founder shares that give them super majority in terms of voting. If right now Google could come in and buy every single share outstanding of Palantir, and guess what? Peter Thiel can say, go kick rocks. And They'd have to suck it up. The F you Can't share. do anything. <laughs> yeah. So pretty much, no, Google, even if Google wanted to or someone else wanted to, they couldn't. Whether that's good for investors or not can be kind of subjective because right now, if someone tell, says to me, oh, yeah, you know what? We'll buy your Palantir shares for you for $30 a share. I'd be the first one to raise my hand. Go right ahead. I got a shit ton of really? 30 shares. bucks. You would, you would cash out. You're done, bro. I'd be up so much right now. Cause I've been DCA the entire time. You know, if you're telling me I could get a huge win right now, I take it, you know, and especially if I could take that money and put it into some of the other things that are out there. So, yeah. Okay. Sachin, your thoughts would uh, Google ever buy pound here? See, Google will never buy Palantir. The reason for that is so uh, some of you have actually seen the dot com. And you know, if you remember the 1998 antitrust case that that was against Bill Gates, so all the big companies and all the new upcoming companies have asked this question how to avoid that moment for us. OK, now, if you see like Google and Facebook Meta, they went into this kind of group structuring. They have a, a, a additional CEO sometime coming from outside to save themselves that kind of situation. Uh, the whole like Chris mentioned, the whole idea of founders share was built around it so that the control of the company can be decided by two or three people whether it's good or bad it can only be decided with time because if they take the decisions in a way that that destroy the shareholder value i mean then it's bad okay and to be fair i mean if you say despite all the love i have for palantir we also have to be very clear that Palantir is now like 18, 19 years old company or at least 18 years old company that started at the same time as Facebook and nowhere near the same valuation. Okay, so where the criticism is due, I mean, uh, in a, in a, if the company would have been controlled by, by investors, uh, I, I believe it has already been acquired by some. Okay, yeah. so the only reason it's not been acquired because of the control that founders have on it and they need to justify it by turning this company in next few years, a hundred to hundred million dollar. If it doesn't reach that point, okay, I would say that uh, this founder share structure has actually destroyed value for shareholders. And I agree with Chris, money today on table is always better than money in future. I'll give my thoughts real quick before Dom. I also think that, uh, just the value of a Palantir, not working with Russia, China, the philosophical values, all the sh shots they've taken at Google, Peter Thiel, obviously not liking. I mean, like it would be really hard to justify them with their founder shares. Be like, yeah, we'll take a $30, $40 premium, especially not only because they philosophically don't align with Google, but because Carp has said this company should be 20 times bigger. And he doesn't strike me as a guy who gives up on his ambitions just because the market has turned down. In fact, I think he's excited that the market has turned down because he's literally said, we're happy that this is you know, our moment to shine. So um, I do think- So then why isn't he buying some shares, bro? If he thinks it's well, going to be 20 times bigger. I don't, I don't know about that. Anthony Noto, he's buying a lot. He's so fine. He, he's gobbling them up every day. Dom, what are your thoughts on Google and Palantir? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say it couldn't happen because anything can happen. Is it likely or probable? No, not in my opinion, based on the share structure and based on the, um, even just what like you would lose from an employee count that would be a big sellout for the employees to see that happen when they have a specific niche culture that they've fostered and each division and team of engineers uh, are so empowered on these massive important projects um, that that wouldn't necessarily be the case if they got bought out by by Palantir or by Google. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay. That was the, the main pound here for the news for the week. Was there anything else that was super big on your world? Yeah. I, I mean, I think that I haven't seen anyone cover the Dresner study. Um, it is a 200 page study <laughs> and that's probably why no one's covered it, but I, I, go did ahead. You, did you, 
I, did you do any research on? I looked at it. It was it's fluff. To be honest with you, it's a lot of fluff. It's not fluff. It's no. It's, 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 it's fluff. A, in the BI world. It's an industry respected report. I guess. Okay. Yeah. You know? Which guess what? Palantir Commission. So. What do you, you mean? Know, Palantir's. You this know. is not. This wasn't an independent thing that like you know just randomly they did a report. They specifically did this for Palantir. They said, okay, yeah, go ahead, compare us to the other things. So a lot of the stuff that was in there was, you know, geared towards saying why Palantir is a great company, which is okay. I mean, a lot of companies do it. Like imagine right now me saying to you, hey, Ahmed, I'll pay you $100 if you tell the world how, how great I am. That's pretty much Chris what it was. great. He's phenomenal. There you go. I love Chris. <laughs> you know, the, the most important part in that report is, and this is important to actually expose the hypocrisy that Wall Street media has for it. You remember that uh, Jim Cramer has made in the statement, I will invest in Palo Alto instead of Palantir. So he was comparing Palo Alto uh, with Palantir. He was treating Palantir more as a, as a cyber security company. See, there is no mention of Palo Alto in this report. It's BI report. And what people are missing is that you compare Palantir in BI category, you compare Palantir in terms of cyber security. So what the heck this company is doing there, it is present in all these, these layers. And if you if you accept that, then there is a power of integration. And this is what the 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 Wall Street actually don't cover at all. Yeah. So, I agree. Yeah, I don't want to okay. give too much away with uh, the interview that I'm gonna post for uh uh, code strap, but the, we, we were on camera for an hour and we were off camera for two and a half. Uh, I could talk his ear off. I, I learned so much from this guy. Um, he really opened my eyes to the differentiations on what foundry truly is. When you start looking at the different layers, as you're talking, Sachin and the modules and the way they approach the technology, uh, even from the developer perspective, differently than other companies and then putting the security first premise on everything that they do. Um, they, I could, I could, I told him, I said, you know, I've been too hard on them going so fast to accelerate like snowflake in sales motion and go to the mid market and, and, and rush in and get more customers because what they're really doing is focusing on industries building those foundry archetypes. And then once you cascade that and you get the networking effects in that industry, you can start conquering it and other, other people in that industry will have to conform or they will be left behind. But, but Dom, I'll, I'll just hit on one point on that specific thing. The technology is great. And I do understand the approach to being security first, but I have seen on so many levels how sometimes being security first can drag you so 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 pretty much like it would, it takes much longer for adoption to happen to the point where competitors can come and eat away. So an example is BBM, right? Are you guys ever use BlackBerry? Anyone here use BlackBerry? I'm sure that everyone had BlackBerry in 2008. BBM was the most secure way of communicating. World leaders used Blackberries to communicate. Why? Because they had end-to-end -end security and BBM was super secure. Great thing. But guess what? Because they were security first, they could not out-innovate Apple in bringing something that was more mass market, right? So I think what it is, is you have to be security first, but be security first where it matters. And then if you don't have to be security first, don't be security first in that specific thing. Tailor it to the mass market. So I think. That was always one of the reasons why I always advocate the Palantir um, pretty much divides themselves into super secure government business, federal with all the stuff that they have. And on the other side, a commercial business that focuses on maximizing commercial adoption, because if they don't real debate because we actually have a debate now. Uh, uh, no, no. I mean, it's always good to debate a little. No, bit. debate's but, healthy. Yeah. I love it. it yeah. make, I'm sure the yeah. viewers like it. So what I would say is. Secure first in the world that we live in needs to be in commercial and government, period. Totally get what you're saying, because I've worked in the security business for a very long time, that if you design your security framework in a way, it can actually slow people down. It can lose progress. It can not allow a uh, short, reduced time to value. But after learning how Palantir does their security in Foundry uh, and, and do things differently, once you've gotten on board uh 
I truly believe they have a 10x differentiation when it comes to security and that they can, and the fact that they have all the abilities to do the data pipelines into whatever apps you have today, I don't think you would have that necessarily slow down. I think the ramp up of the initial deployment would be the slowest piece. And actually the, the part of that that is the slowest is when you do the data pipelines in, you are still dependent on that IT admin or that person who owns the data to allow you to turn that on and feed that data into Foundry. So at that point, depending on how big your organization is, if it's like a big or like BP, that could be like weeks, months even. Uh, whereas if it's a smaller organization, that could happen very quickly. So I get what you're saying, because yes, security in a lot of areas uh, can slow things down. That's why you always have security and developers butting heads all the yeah. time. But I mean, when you just, I don't know, I know you guys have done some some interviews with Coach Ryan, and, and I just, my mind was blown when he started just talking about how the design of how they approach containers and Kubernetes and everything else, like they, they definitely, they know what they're doing from a technology standpoint. Now it goes to execution, which all four of us have talked about. How do you get that message out there? And I'm hoping this Google partnership will will start to do that. Yeah, I, and, I, and I just want to say the reason why I'm saying the security piece is because some industries value security way more than other industries, right? If you're working in an industry that's very like very mature, that's there's really not much IP that you have to deal with. You know, it's you know, it's not really who of you to care about security as much there are basic security features that you always want have built in but like just like you said it ends up hindering developers from doing their job oh, yeah. and actually oh, yeah. adding to the cost so they're like look i don't need all this federal you know like i don't need the same level of security as you need for the federal government to get i you know f certified like ip6 certified just get me what i need to get done you know and so that's foundry like, does that right foundry yeah. does that when you uh he said he's gonna have a lot more demos coming and, and foundry does enable developers very well to keep through their their ci cd pipelines and building their code fast and not being slowed down to where they have to go to the security teams and get things uh fixed i want to i want to ask uh i can speak on behalf of oil and gas industry i mean uh, we don't it's, it will be wrong to say that we care about security. We are paranoid about security, actually. Okay. I have seen people, I mean, they go into these workshops and the, some of the best companies will explain them for three days, like why their platforms are secure. And these guys will come out of this workshop and they say, we are still not convinced. So in oil and gas, like for example, until a few years back, nobody actually even knew that how much reserves Saudi Arabia has. Okay. What kind of porosity, permeability of a reservoir. People are really paranoid about securing their data in our industry. And especially like when the oil price nowadays is 100, I can tell you like a lot of people like they change job because they have seen things. Okay. And you, you I mean, like, for example, if I have lived in an area, I have, I have drilled wells in a certain geology. I mean, I know that. Okay. That's a knowledge that, that stays in my head. So oil and gas mining like especially resource based uh, industries the security is is paramount people can go to inferior products and i agree with the with chris also like you cannot bank too much or you cannot if you if you if you anchor too much on one pillar you end up actually deteriorating something other i think this is where the dom uh, when dom was mentioning like so far what we have seen that palantir is trying to balance these pillars together but you also have to 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 acknowledge that Palantir at this point is not one of the best executing companies as well. Okay, they have, they are they're struggling, they're struggling to figure out like how they are going to make this massive product and value and actually take it. They have done some really good moves, okay, but they are not yet mass market company yet. I think that is the that is the main hurdle, and that pretty much will define whether this stock is is twenty five dollar or this stock is two hundred fifty dollar. The, the one thing is they're, they're competitors, which is usually their own, like each company's own data science teams haven't failed enough yet. What I mean by that is if you're, think of it this way, you're working at a company, right? You have a data science team. The data science team, they're part of your digital transformation where they're telling you, hey, if you do this, 
this is the end results that you get. So if your goal is to get, let's say, 15% more customers next year, the data science team will tell you which areas, what you need to do to get there. So Palantir essentially, and this is goes right back into what does Palantir do? Well, Palantir takes all your data and helps you figure out how to do that. Well, a lot of companies, they look at the price of Palantir being in the millions of dollars and they say, nah, man, we'll just hire our own data science folk. You know, they, they have graduates from an MBA course, you know, who have software background and they'll code all the stuff and they'll be able to give you the answer. Well, guess what? All of that stuff has to be put into um, certain softwares. So that's what Snowflake does, right? Like you take all the data, you put it in a Columnar database and you build applications around it. The thing is though, all these, all these people are gonna fail. Okay, and I think then that's what we have to go back to. And that's what CodeStrap was telling everyone. 80% of all data science applications, they fail. Palantir has a much, much higher success rate. So right now, after spending $10 million, I go back to my data science team and I say, hey, guys, give me some, you know, what should I do? And they're like, well, you know, we spent all this money, but we may need to spend some more. I'll tell them to go F themselves and then go get Palantir. So we have not been... Palantir has not been around long enough in this field commercially where they can say, look, your data science team is failing you. You need to get us so that we can make this better and you know get you to the end product. The other thing is you need a lot of developers to kind of push for it. A lot, there's not too many developers that know about Palantir. I mean, yeah, the YouTube people like well, us, that's we why talk we about it. the premium yeah. offer, right? Like uh, yeah. I talked to that with CodeStrap and he was like, I agree. I agree. I'm trying. He said, I'm trying. I'm trying to do my best to Both get the word out. Holding it up for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if if no one knows how to build on your platform, then yeah, you're not going to get the customers. Right now, that's why if you look at Apple, right, all the people that build on the Apple App Store, the environment, because they're like, look, we'll give you all the tools you need to become an Apple de certified developer. We'll even build all the tools, the language. So that's what Palantir needs to do. It needs to get a vibrant developer community that's going to push their product out so that people are building applications on top of it. And same thing with, like, I really wish there was a freemium product that I could even go and demo to one of my, my colleagues, you know, and just say, hey, listen, this is what I was able to do. Instead of doing half my job that I do on a goddamn spreadsheet, I have a much easier way through Palantir, right? And I can build an application. I can share this application with the entire organization. Right now, I, I, I swear to God, right now, guys, I spent half of my day doing spreadsheets and there, my my entire like team thinks i'm a genius because i know how to do some formulas on a spreadsheet what i would want to, what i would like to do is have a data pipeline already built and then just say okay let me show you in a low code way how to just drag drop and then build the application that you need so that you get all the data that you need i can't i can't do that for them for excel you know if i give them my excel spreadsheet Within like 30, within like probably a couple of days, they're like, oh, something messed up. You know, I, I put something in the wrong location and it's gone. So it's, let me, let it's me tell you why too, like just to piggyback off of what you said there. And I've been in that exact same situation. I've even done it in Power BI. And that's even more frustrating. Um, they're getting continuous, continuous reduced time to value for the business when you have a living, breathing a data ontology that can be manipulated to business outcomes and actually give you results and insights real time. You can't do that when you have Chris's spreadsheet and he needs to go share it with Sakshin and then he needs to look at it. He makes some edits and Amit has to look at it and you have all the, oh, well, we need to have several board meetings. And if, if you can have it to where everyone has access to what they're supposed to have access to, and the consequential digital twin can actually tell you, if we make these decisions, these are the outcomes we will reach. That is when you see alpha. That is when you see, we saved X amount of million dollars because of these decisions we were able to make that we would have never had the insights to do. And that to me is what excites me about Palantir. So I agree with both of you. So guys, the catch is following. It all works in this way, as long as we, make an assumption that employees are working in the best interest of the organization. The B2B context is very complex. When you bring something new, people first see, okay, if I buy a new product, I'm actually going to jeopardize my existing relationship. People try to protect, protect their relationships a lot. Okay. The second thing is people try to look back and think, okay, what will happen today? I have this much power in terms of appropriating funds, in terms of deciding things. 
if I increase the level of transparency, people will know exactly how I do things. So there is a power context and this is why the B2B sale is, is, is very different. And this is exactly what happened and Palantir has acknowledged in past is that they have made IT team adversarial the way they came up from a top-down selling bottom. Palantir self-service capabilities are non-existent. Palantir communication uh, with the developer community and engagement at best is like not even thin, it's like a decimal. Okay, these are two things they need to figure it out. Without this, they are not never going to become a, a, a juggernaut they want to be. I think this is this is pretty much very simple. It is shame that uh, you know I, I often talk about the companies that are very new and I like them. I mean, like one of the company I always mentioned about is Harness. Is I said you know, these companies Harness has a self service product. I mean, for last two years. Okay, Palantir doesn't have a self service product. Okay, so thing is, people will if they cannot test your product if they cannot go and uh, enroll to your product online then they depend on your sales team sales team was also non-existent to i mean until last year so how the hell people reach volunteer i mean there is no sales team i mean like last year we saw that no i agree the, i mean the, I don't know anyone's there, fighting you on that i think that's what like we nine people who had a tenure more than uh, nine months or 12 people something like that you don't have a self-service product how people reach Palantir. What amazes me, and I think you know, there is this is a sad part, but what amazes me that people who actually reach Palantir and who use Palantir, they are completely in awe of solution. So, what so, so Sachin, there is someone in our use in, in the chat right now who actually uses Foundry. I think the name Matt Money. Matt, would you be down to come on to this chat? I think well, Matt's been ones. down. Matt's been down to come on. He's probably going to come on. We should schedule it soon. For yeah. 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 Sorry, Sachin. Sorry to interrupt. But I, I keep seeing that. And I was like, because a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, he actually has experience with, you know, which he could yeah. probably lay better, way, give us better context. He uses you know, it every day in the oil and gas industry. He's there. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I think one, one thing which people are not trying to learn enough is, that why Palantir revenue per client is far bigger than any of its peers. Okay, I think this is this is a puzzle. I think more people need to, to look into and solve because you cannot get more money from a client if you are not creating the value. So why what is this value that Palantir is creating that their peer even working together is not able to create? And this is actually the main. This is one of the biggest bull faces I have about Palantir is that Palantir can enable use cases and solutions. Like for example, I mean, I know in the case of BP, I mean, BP downstream is on Azure and upstream is on on uh, AWS or maybe it's other way around. But they use Palantir to actually uh, to to connect both data sets or to connect both part of businesses. Okay, BP when they started with uh, Palantir, their objective was to increase and build a still to around their production operations. But when they decided to pivot uh, towards uh, new energy, yeah, they took Palantir with them. So this is, I think, what people are missing, that that once they are in and they show their value, it's very difficult. I mean, companies will push them and they will try to learn more about it, do less of the consulting services part and all that. But when they are in, they can create value like no one else. And that is something. But the challenge is the process for them to get into a company, either via self-service or via sales, Right now, it's it's struggling. So, in short, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this what's, hard, what's harder, fixing that problem, or having the technology that's 10x good as it is to begin with? Right? Like, so, I think I think yeah. we can fix this problem. So, getting the technology that is 10x better is always harder, but it is also not given that they can sort the sales channel until unless they sort some of the cultural issues within the company. Because, you know, if issues exist, that means there are some reasons. They need, they, they acknowledge it, but they need to address it. Okay. It's not as hard as building a 10x better product, but it is still a hard problem. I would agree. I would agree. 